Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, garden spot of the world. The farms found here are some of the most productive in the country. Each year, tourists arrive in this area to see and to learn more about the hardworking people known as the Amish, the people who have resisted change in our modern times, choosing to plow their fields with horses. Snuggled within this timeless setting, between the green fields are creeks and streams. This water power was harnessed to power mills. This is Risser's Mill, located in the western part of Lancaster County. In order for the mills to do business with farmers on both sides of the creek, covered bridges were constructed. The bridges were covered to protect the timbers. This 82-foot bridge was built in 1872 over the Little Chickies Creek. Many of the bridges you are about to see are well off the beaten path and deep into Pennsylvania Dutch country. Because of weight restrictions, they carry only local traffic. The Theodore Burr Arch construction is found in this bridge and most of the other bridges we will see. The arch runs the length of the span, holding the supporting timbers in place. The first covered bridge on the northern part of the Cocalico Creek is Booker's Mill Bridge near Reamstown. Originally constructed in 1891, it has been rebuilt several times due to damage by flood waters of the Cocalico. Only 60 feet long, it is one of the shortest covered bridges still being used in the area. Something you notice about the Keller's Mill Bridge is it is white, not red. In fact, originally, just about all bridges were whitewashed inside and out. The 70-foot-long bridge was built in 1891 and is located near Akron. Zook's Mill Bridge almost went Hollywood. It was filmed for a Jerry Lewis movie that was never released. The 89-foot span was built near Brownstown in 1849 for only $700. The bridge has had very little flooding from the Cocalico, but it does have a high water marker from the Agnes 1972 flood. One of the most scenic bridges is located on the Hammer Creek. This is Herb's Bridge, well known for appearing on many calendars, postcards, and paintings. The 80-foot structure was built in 1887. The bridge shows one of the original uses of covered bridges, advertising. The insides were painted as billboards, advertising hardware stores, blacksmith shops, and funeral parlors. A local Mannheim artist, Irma K. Wenger, was so moved by the beauty of this bridge and its setting, she put brush to canvas and presented this artistic rendering. The Landis Mill Bridge is located on the Little Conestoga, near Park City, a busy shopping area. The 1873 bridge uses the King Post Truss, no arch, and is only 53 feet in length, the shortest in Lancaster County. Located next to busy Route 30, the Willows Bridge was reconstructed in 1962 from the Goods Fording and Miller's Farm Bridges. You won't have far to gallop. It's only 72 feet over the Mill Creek beneath the boards. In 
1876, Kurtz's Mill Bridge was built. The 94-foot bridge originally spanned the Conestoga River, but after the flood of 72 was moved to its current location over the Mill Creek in Lancaster County Central Park. The 128-foot Red Run Bridge is on private land, but can easily be seen from the road. The 1866 span is currently being used as a storage barn. This could truly be called a bridge to nowhere because the waters of Muddy Creek were diverted around the bridge in such a way that no water flows under its piers. A landlocked covered bridge is an ominous sight. It could be imagined ghosts reside here on Halloween. Also on private land is the 1844, 58-foot-long Buck Hill Bridge, originally known as the Eichelberger Store Bridge. It was moved to the Kissel Hill location by the current owners, where it spans a small pond. This is the former Jackson Sawmill near Quarryville. And next to it, the Jackson Sawmill Bridge. The 1878 bridge's piers were washed away by the Octorara Creek. It was rebuilt and rededicated by the Lancaster County Commissioners in 1985. Again, the Theodore Burr King Post Arch spanning 156 feet. This location is in the very heart of the Amish country. Within sight of the slumbering Groundhog Lodge, on the banks of the west branch of the Octorara, sits White Rock Forge Bridge. It is 87 feet in length and was last rebuilt in 1884. This bridge sees a great deal of rural activity in the course of a day. It is a hard-working antique. This is Mannheim Memorial Park, home of Shearer's Bridge spanning the Big Chickies Creek. The 9-foot bridge was first constructed in 1847. As the result of a community effort, the bridge was saved from demolition when a new bridge was to be built on the Colebrook Road. It was moved intact four miles to the park in 1971. Today, the bridge is in excellent shape as pedestrians and bicyclists enjoy its beauty and shade on a sunny July day. Further down the Chickies is the Kaufman Distillery Bridge, built in 1874. The 96-foot bridge is spanned with a common Theodore Burr King Post Arch. On a hot summer day, the shade is appreciated by man, and beast. Although a distillery was once located near here, no evidence of that structure remains. The Chickies winds southward to Shanks Mill Bridge, one of the best maintained covered bridges in Lancaster County. It was first built in 1847 and rebuilt in 1855. This bridge measures 96 feet. A road marker leads us to the 91-foot-long Seagrist Mill Bridge, also on the Chickies. The 
bridge is located in a good fishing spot, just ask this lad. Heading south, the last covered bridge on the Chickies is Foree's Bridge, erected in 1869 by Elias McMillan. McMillan is well known across Lancaster County as a man who designed and built over 40 bridges. We now head northward on the Conestoga River, which means a river that winds around trees. That is exactly what it does near the Pool Forge Bridge. Built in 1859, it is rumored James Buchanan met one of the loves of his life on this very bridge, although the former president never did marry. The bridge now rests on privately owned land, but can easily be seen from the road near Churchtown. Near Goodville is Weaver's Mill Bridge. Although the bridge is over 100 years old, it is in excellent condition because of the surrounding flat land and high piers, and has not been touched by the waters of the Conestoga. This is Eberly's Cider Mill. The waters of the Conestoga will soon be put to work here to make electricity. Nearby is the bridge of the same name. Built in 1846, it is the oldest remaining covered bridge in the state highway system. This bridge was about to be demolished when local neighbors saved the day. The Pinetown Bridge is located near Oregon, where the waters of Lititz Run meet the Conestoga. Built two years after the Civil War, the 133-foot bridge was washed downstream during the Agnes Flood. It came to rest only a few hundred yards from the Hunsaker Bridge downstream. Workmen then were able to return the bridge to its piers. This is the 180-foot-long Hunsaker Bridge the last as we move southward on the Conestoga River. It is the second longest and newest in the county since the original span was destroyed by Agnes. The state was scheduled to put in a replacement concrete bridge, but once again, the local residents prevailed and the covered bridge was built using modern technology. Much of the character of this bridge is its unpainted exterior. We will now trace the bridges of the Peckway Creek. First is the Paradise Bridge, built in 1893. In the past, the 113-foot structure suffered roof damage from tractor trailers. The day we were filming, some construction was in progress on the piers. Downstream on the Peckway is Hers Mill, now located in Mill Bridge Museum at Soudersburg. A favorite of the visitors to the Pennsylvania Dutch country, the two-span bridge is 178 feet in length and was originally constructed in 1885 by Theodore Burr. Incidentally, there is a group called the Theodore Burr Covered Bridge Society with membership of some 600 people who are active in the preservation of all covered bridges. This is the narrowest bridge in Lancaster County, Neff's Mill. The 103-foot span is only 11 feet wide. You better blow your horn before you cross. Near this mill on the Peckway is the Lime Valley Bridge. Originally constructed in 1871, it is 104 feet in length. This bridge is rated at only a few tons. However, there are times when it is said 20-ton trucks have gone over it, only realizing what they had done when safely on the other side.
Baumgartner's Mill Bridge is located near Martikville. It is one of the best maintained in the area and is a work of beauty. It is 116 feet long, and during rebuilding, the road was straightened such that you could see the mill that gave the bridge its name when looking through the end. The stone mill was constructed in 1800, the bridge in 1860. The Colemanville Bridge on the Peckway was washed away twice during flooding. However, work was underway to move the bridge to piers five feet higher as we filmed. Some of the repairs were done in 1899 by Elias McMillan. It is a long bridge at 183 feet and was originally constructed in 1856. Only two bridges remain on our tour, both located on the Lancaster County, Chester County line, and both cross the eastern branch of the Octorara Creek. This is Mercer's Mill Bridge. It is the widest in the county at almost 15 feet. The bridge was built in 1880 and is 103 feet in length. Natural wonders abound in this remote location. The granddaddy of all covered bridges in Lancaster County is the Pine Grove Bridge. It spans 195 feet using two Burr Arch King Post trusses. The bridge was last restored in 1884 by Elias McMillan. The bridge withstood the 1972 Agnes Flood. The Octorara Water Company building and the falls can easily be seen from the middle of the bridge. The bridge connects Lancaster and Chester counties. Lancaster County, land of the Amish, and land of 30 covered bridges. The Susquehanna River at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The Juniata River near Newport. Both rivers touch Perry County, a mix of mountains and valleys. A county heavily dependent on agriculture. Perry County has 14 covered bridges crossing the many slowly moving creeks and streams. Rice's Bridge crosses Sherman's Creek in Tyrone Township near Landisburg. 
The 132-foot bridge was built around 1870. The roadway is laid with 16-foot planks. As is the case with many of Perry County's covered bridges, steel I-beams reinforce the bridge work to give access to heavier traffic. Just below the falls at Bixler's Run near Loysville is Wagner's Bridge. The structure was built in 1889 at a cost of only $1,100. Now closed to traffic, the 17-foot wide, 84-foot long structure uses the familiar Burr Arch construction. On May 23, 1947, the bridge was given to the care of the Historical Society of Perry County. The Enslow Bridge over Sherman's Creek would be an excellent spot for a picnic or quiet reflection. The 118-foot bridge sits well off the main road. It was built in 1904 at a cost of $2,200. Another bridge well off the beaten path is Bistline Bridge. The structure shows its age, well over 100 years old. The Burr Bridge is 96 feet long and is reinforced with two steel I-beams. To get this shot of the Mount Pleasant Bridge, our photographer got his feet wet. One of the newer bridges in Perry County, it was built in 1918. The 73-foot bridge spans Sherman's Creek near New Germantown. Here is proof of what steel reinforcement can do. This is the view of Sherman's Creek looking out of Book's Bridge. Built in 1884 using Burr construction, the bridge is 70 feet long and 17 feet wide. There's a covered bridge somewhere in this picture. Can you find it? Well, it's right there. Nobody's going over this bridge today. The Kokenderfer Bridge crosses the Big Buffalo Creek and sits parallel to the bridge that replaced it. it makes a perfect place to store a load of hay. The bridge was built in 1919 at a cost of $2,400. Still on the Big Buffalo Creek, these are the piers of the Seville Covered Bridge. Overall length is 60 feet with two plies of two inch oak planking on the floor. Clay's Bridge calls Little Buffalo State Park its home. The bridge originally crossed the Little Buffalo Creek. When the park was built, it was moved to its present location within the park. The Burr Span Bridge was built in 1890. This red bridge is called Red Bridge. It crosses the Wildcat Creek 
that's about all it crosses because the bridge is no longer in service. Overall length of the bridge is 55 feet. It was constructed in 1886. Everyone knows 1948 was a good year for a paint job. This is the largest of the covered bridges in Perry County, the Delville Bridge. It is 20 feet wide and crosses Sherman's Creek with a span of almost 175 feet. Originally built in 1889, again the Burr Arch construction is found. In 1932, the center pier was added for the support of heavier load capacities. This is a Dares covered bridge located near Cisna Run. One of the larger bridges at 150 feet. It was built in Civil War times about 1864 then in 1919 was rebuilt. The planking on the floor is three inch oak laid crosswise. Under the floor of the bridge are five steel I-beams and three piers. This in the water shot is Sherman's Creek near New Germantown. The new Germantown Bridge crosses here. The bridge originally was constructed in 1891. It uses a 12-foot roadway and has 2-inch by 16-foot planking laid lengthwise on the floor. Reinforcement is provided by twin I-beams. This looks like an excellent fishing spot, but on our visit to the new Germantown Bridge, we didn't see any fishermen crossing, just various branches of the constabulary. The last of Perry County's covered bridges crosses the Big Buffalo Creek. Fleischer's Bridge was built in 1887 at an original cost of only $1,595. The roadway is 13 feet wide and has a length of 125 feet. In 1960, two 30-inch I-beams were added to give the bridge a seven-ton limit. You've just seen the 14 remaining covered bridges in Perry County as of 1991. Now some parting views of Perry County on a bridge.
You bet. We'll see you then. Billboard welcomes you to Millersburg. The gazebo in the town square is a point of pride for the locals, a logo for the town nestled on the sleepy banks of the Susquehanna. But in Millersburg, all the signs point to the greatest attraction, the Millersburg Ferry. The boats, two in number, consist of the Falcon, and the Roaring Bull. For over 175 years, these vessels have provided transportation for people and the commerce of the day. Because of the shallow depth of the Susquehanna in this area, many airboats can be found in use. Jack Dillman has over 25 years service with the Millersburg Ferry and is the senior captain he enjoys relating his experiences. I had a chance to work with Hunter and Radel. They were the longtime ferry owners from about 1906 until 1968. So I'm a Hunter and Radel trained man. Also because I was on during that period in the uh, 40s, I not only had a chance to steer the first Falcon and the second Roaring Bull, which were in operation at that time, but also a couple of coal digger steamboats, something that's long gone from the river now. The first private owner that we know anything about was Michael Crow. Uh, he didn't operate the ferry he owned, he would lease it out. In addition to the ferry, in fact, he had a sawmill and a farm. Now the last private owner of the Millersburg Ferry was Robert Wallace. He also had chicken houses and an orchard. He didn't operate the ferry, he would lease it out. Now this all came to an end in 1990 when community banks over here at Millersburg bought the ferry from Wallace for $10,000. Then community banks turned around and gave it to the town of Millersburg for free. A very good thing because for Millersburg to attempt to buy the ferry and maintain it, it, was, it, would, it would just simply have been too much. Even now, as we speak, the town is having a very rough time of it, mainly because here you're looking at 19th century technology trying to put up with 20th century regulations.
deepest water is actually between Whitefish Island and Crow's Landing, the last 300 yards of our travel. That's why that section is referred to as the old raft channel. In the spring, as many as 500 rafts would come down by. Not that the Susquehanna is that great, but the old raftsmen had to go where the best water was available, and to them, the best of it all in this area was this last 300 yards that we're getting ready to cross. Landing the ferry at Crow's Landing is a one-man operation. The last time steam was owned by the Millersburg Ferry was right around World War I. By the end of World War I, they had done away with it and were going into internal combustion. However, on June the 14th, 1948, something had gone wrong with the second model of the Roaring Bull. I don't remember what it was, but I do know we borrowed a coal digger steamboat and for a week, we were hauling cars back and forth with it. At the end of the week, the uh, second Roaring Bull had been repaired, so the Coal Digger Steamboat was returned, and that was the end of the steam forever on the Millersburg Ferry. Too bad.
The Falcon is at rest after another day of service. Near the landing on the Millersburg side is Tina's Sandwich Shop. Tina Fetter is a board member and has her special memories of the ferry. Well, in 1987, my son was born in September, and the end of October, um, I think it was the beginning of November, we had him baptized on the ferry. We decided we went somewhere quiet and peaceful, and so we went out in the middle of the river and had our minister come down, and he baptized our son. It was like halfway in between um, Halfway Island and First Corner. Last year, we accommodated, I think the numbers were like 40,000 people. Uh, and that was just walk on passengers. Then, you know, it had a certain number for um, the, the cars, but with each car there was also a passenger too. And so we, I'd say we accommodated probably close to 50,000 people. Over at the Chamber of Commerce, the operations manager, Jerry Dillman, keeps the business end of the Millersburg Ferry going. We knew the hunters and the radels when they had operated. That's when I was a little boy. And they're the ones that taught my brother his routine as far as learn, learning about the boats and how to operate the boats and things like that. They were his teacher. And uh, we were very good friends as long as I can remember. And uh, it's always been part of my life. I mean, it's just like part of me, you know. I've known nothing else but to have the boats around. In the winter, the boats are removed from the Susquehanna for inspection and maintenance. The boats have definite personalities. You'll find if you're on the Roaring Bull, you feel like you, you, you picture yourself on a charging bull. That boat has get up and go, and you you start out with a with a surge, and it seems like that boat, you can feel the power behind that boat, just like you're trying to hold on to a raging bull. Now you take the falcon. A falcon is a bird that soars, and it's smooth, and it glides easy, and it seems like it's kind of sure of where it's going. The Falcon's that way. The Falcon isn't a, a rough ride. It's a quiet ride. It's a, a smooth, graceful ride. And it seems like when you, they handle it, it's, you put your mind of the Falcon, like the bird, soaring through the air. It almost gives you the same personality trait. Although they both get you here to there, it just seems like each one has their own personality. This door, located on the crow's landing side, is used to signal the captains on the Millersburg side that someone is waiting to cross. When the ferry arrives, the reset of the signal is a simple process. A local utility uses the ferry on a regular basis. To give you a rundown on the Pennsylvania Power and Light Company, they are the Millersburg Ferry's oldest regular customers They've had an account with us since 1929. As a result, on each ferry boat, there's a clipboard for their benefit. When they come aboard, they'll sign the clipboard, and at the end of the month, the paper on there is turned in to get our bill paid.
but it's to me a very appropriate thing that here we have a river 444 miles long at one time there were over 100 ferries on it now the millersburg ferry is the only commercial one left and yet this is one of the most beautiful sections on the Susquehanna River. How ideal. Fairview, Espen Chay, Cherry Hill, Grouse Grove, all aboard! The Bluebell, the 11 o'clock train, is now headed for Lemon Place Junction. The locomotive that pulls the 11.30 train, the Strasburger, is undergoing final preparations in the yard. Number 1223 is painted in its original Pennsylvania Railroad scheme. This engine, several cars, and specially designed Hello Dolly car, which was built in the Strasburg shop, starred with Barbara Streisand and Walter Matthau in the movie version of Hello Dolly. The 11.30 train is now pulling in and we'll hop on board and see just some of the sights on the road to paradise. Our conductor is Ned Sheffer. The route over which we are traveling today is one of the oldest railroad rights away in the entire world. It was given to the Strasburg Railroad by an act of the Pennsylvania State Legislature on June 9th, 1832. And on June 9th, 1982, we celebrated 150 years of continuous services to the communities of Strasburg and Paradise. Fairview, Fairview Crossing is next. The Red Caboose Lodge and Motel will be located to the running left of our train. The Cherry Hill Station may be the world's smallest. Now watch for that Cherry Hill Station and don't you blink or you're going to miss it. And as we go by, you'll notice a sign reads population 17 more or less. Well, that means more when we arrive and a whole lot less when we leave. Now, if you continue to look out to the running left of our train, we'll be passing the 11 o'clock train returning to Strasburg. This is one of the few places on the continent of North America that I know of that one steam train passes another steam train on a regularly scheduled basis. Lemon Place Junction next where the main line of the Strasburg Railroad meets the main line of Amtrak and Conrail. Now back in the early 1900s, there was as high as 32 passenger trains a day would stop here at Lemon Place Junction. Today there are 22 passenger trains go past here. 
but they don't even slow down. This is Lemon Place Junction, and our next stop will be Paradise, where you can change for Coatesville, Downingtown, Paoli, North Philadelphia, Trenton, Newark, and New York, Lancaster, Harrisburg, Altoona, Johnstown, Pittsburgh, and Points West. That is, if you can run fast enough to catch the Amtrak train. At Lemon Place Junction, the 1223 is turned around and we head back to Strasburg. If you're interested as to how we establish our speed, it's a simple matter. The oldest timetable we ever found for our line was in the Lancaster Inland Daily for December 2nd, 1851. And we still follow that same basic schedule today nearly 135 years later. So if you'd like to see how fast great-great-grandpa traveled, this is it. Somewhere under 60 miles an hour. And please, don't anybody get off our train and run ahead of our locomotive. That infuriates our engineer. By the time we reach our station, you will have traveled some nine miles over the rails of history. We thank you for coming because it is you who makes all of this possible. We hope you will come back again, bring your friends and neighbors, and don't forget your picnic lunch. You'll find there's always something different. The Strasburg has gone further backward in the last 28 years than most railroads have gone forward. Next time you travel, take the train. It's 10 times safer and a lot more fun.